it is three o'clock, so I will call this uh, meeting to order. We begin, as always, with the invocation and pledge. Mr. Perkins has agreed to lead. Mr. Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Uh, we come now to the adoption of the agenda, and I want to do a couple of things. One is item 9G under operational items. I'd like to move up in front of 9A. Um, and then I would like to add 9H, uh, Executive Director Search. That was a referral from the Citizens Advisory Committee. Does anyone else have any changes to the agenda? Dr. Walker? Yes, under, uh, new, under new business uh, CAC appointment. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Perkins? Move the agenda. It's amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Please vote. And it passes four to zero. There are no public hearings. Uh, the next item is open forum, and I have one pink she sheet. Um, uh, Ms. Michelle Schneier has asked to speak. You are recognized, Ms. Schneier. My name is Michelle Schneier. I live downtown in District 3. I'd like to speak on going forward with the selection of the new executive director. I'd like to express that I will respect the board's vote and will support and back the decision you make. I have nothing but kind words to say about everyone on the board and the staff, and I very much would like to be part of this team. Mr. Sorrell has been my go-to person for the last two years. He has always been available to answer any questions, and I really appreciate him and everything he has done for me. I can't thank him enough, and I will miss him tremendously. Things are changing rapidly around here. I would like to compliment the board on your exhaustive nationwide search and the very detailed interview process you conducted. You also had a public mixer involving the Citizens Advisory and a second one involving the ECUA senior staff. I don't think the process could have been more thorough. I only have positive comments about the applicants and the difficulty the board has in selecting a candidate. I don't think I should recommend one since there appears to be considerable divergence in opinions. I am aware that there are deputy executive directors who have said they would do the job. None of them have the five perfect qualities, but each of them are great and would learn quickly. And if they use a cooperative senior staff, they will make the proper decisions for the company. Whether the board appoints one of the two finalists or appoints one of the deputy directors in an interim role until you decide on a better candidate or make the interim selection person permanent, Mr. Sorrell has expressed that he is willing to stay a little longer until you train someone or make a, a permanent selection. He said he's committed to helping ECUA any way within reason. And I just want you to know that I appreciate your efforts and I will back and support the decision the board makes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. And I have no more pink slips. I um, appreciate your comments. Um, we come now to uh, public hearings and there are none. Uh, oh, I sorry, I passed that already. Uh, presentations, uh, there are two. Uh, we get various communications from um, 
Mr. Sorrell, and, and one of them caught my eye. We have such great employees, and it's always fun to hear the stories about what employees do. If you remember that horrible storm we had a few years ago where ECUA employees pulled somebody out of a car that was, the car was drowning in a, in a river th that had once been a road, and another employee went from rooftop to rooftop in Lincoln Park rescuing people. And, and every once in a while, and we know that the staff recognizes these people, but every once in a while, it's nice for the board to have an opportunity to, to say, at a boy or at a girl. Um, and this was one that just um, really caught my attention. So, uh, Mr. Dawson, if, if you don't mind, would you come to the podium and introduce uh, Mr. Jornal M Miller to us? And when you come up, I just want to say a few words because we've been privileged to hear what, what he did and, and Mr. Soderland did, uh, but I'd like for others to. On September 19th, we received a letter from Mr. Robert Olin pertaining to assistance he received from two ECUA employees. He indicated that these two employees helped him when two sheets of plywood uh, fell out of the back of his truck onto a busy roadway. They stopped, they retrieved the sheets of plywood and placed them back in his truck. He said that these two were exemplary ambassadors of ECUA, and I agree. So uh, we have here Mr. Jornel Miller, and the other man was James Soderlin. And I just want us to have an opportunity to look you in your eyes and say thank you. I appreciate it. I just, you know, want to help out. It happened, like, right in, right in front of us, so I was like, we got to help this guy before somebody runs over his wood. And it was a hot day, and he was an older gentleman, too, so. It only seemed like it was the only logical thing really to do. So, so a very well brought up young man. I, I'd like to think my kids would do the same thing, but thank you for doing that. No problem. And, and if our attorney says that was a dangerous thing to do, don't pay a bit of attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, we pulled off the road. <laughs> and tell me what department you're in, Mr. Miller. I'm in, uh, well maintenance, water production. Uh huh. So. Good. And, and Mr. Dawson, did you have anything you'd like to add? Obviously, we're very proud of both of these gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Soderling was sick today, so he couldn't make it. And Jornell is here on his own time. He normally gets off at 2.30, but he wanted to come in, and uh, we're glad that he did. Yes. We're very proud of both of them. And did they tell you would ha you would have to sit through the rest of the meeting? <laughs> no, they let <laughs> you don't have to, but, okay. but if you all will join me in just a round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. The other, the, other, the other person's name was Tyler Soderlin, James Soderlin. Oh. oh, is it James? Yeah. Oh, it said Tyler on our thing. My, my apologies. Okay. You're right. His name's James Tyler Soderling, oh. and he goes by his middle name. But Tyler. Okay. All right. So we got the right guy. Okay. But I, just good, good job. Really appreciate that. I was going to bring that up myself, and it's okay. nice to, nice. To, I understand that the person was elderly too, so it's, you know, it's probably meant a whole lot to him. So thank you. Dr. Walker? As one who once had uh, about 15 or 20 plywood campaign signs slide out of the back of his pickup <laughs> truck as he bounced across Nine Mile Road from one side to the other, I can appreciate the help they gave, yes. When I walked in today, I, I shook his hand. <clears throat> and he shook his, my hand like a man. And I, I said, I'd like to meet your mom because <laughs> that was the first thing I, my husband taught my son was how to shake a hand. And Absolutely. I'm not surprised now that's who it was. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, now we do our Recycle Star Awards where we pick among quite a number of people who um, have been exemplary in their use of our, our recycling. Let's see, who needs to be punished now by... And number 17 is Kathy Anderson. So if staff will communicate with Ms. Anderson and give her all the appropriate awards, we'd appreciate it. Okay, um, we come now to approval of the minutes. Uh, there are two, the special board meeting of September 19th and the regular board meeting of September 24th. 
Uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Perkins. No approval. I second the motion. And is that for both? Yes. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Please vote. And it passes four to zero. Uh, we come now to the report of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Yes, the Citizen Advisory Committee met on October 15th at 3 p.m. All members were present with the exception of Mr. Hammer and Mr. Ponson. Item F was a customer service appreciation video. Mr. Brown, Director of Customer Service, presented a short video relative to Customer Service Appreciation Week. The video was in informational purposes only. Uh, item G was, but it was a great video. He's not here. Uh, item G was an annual renewal maintenance agreement for SunGuard Public Sector Software. The recommendation made by Ms. Benson and seconded by Ms. Ben that the board waive competitive bidding process and authorize the executive director to renew the maintenance contract with Central Square at an estimated cost of 122000 with funds allocated from the appropriate budget line item. The committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item H was an award of purchase for a robotic sorter. The motion was made by Ms. Benson, seconded by Mr. Kimball, that the board approve waiving normal purchasing procedures due to the sole source availability and purchase one tandem robotic sorter from AMP Robotics of Louisville, Colorado at a cost of $225,000 and the required associated air compressor from Blake and Pendleton, the lowest quote at a cost of $58,845 with the funding for the total cost of $283,845 uh, through a chance transfer from CIP Project CT804 to CIP Project CT0003 and the committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item I was award of purchase for new replacement vehicles for fiscal year 2020. The motion was ba made by Mr. Kimball and seconded by Ms. Ben that the board approve the purchase of 18 vehicles for the fiscal year 2020 under the vehicle replacement project from various vendors with the lowest bid prices for a total price of $1,551,157.58 with funding from CIP Project RA806 and declare a surplus the vehicles included in the attached listing and authorize their disposition in accordance with ECUA code after we receive the new vehicle replacements. Committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item J was a contract extension on large-scale and emergency utility construction. The recommendation was made by Ms. Benson and seconded by Ms. Ritz that the board approve the first of a two one-year contract extension with Pensacola Concrete Construction Company, Inc. for large-scale and emergency utility construction based upon the mutual agreement of both parties with no increase in the prices in their original bid and funding primarily from the operating budget of the Recreational Services Department and other budget line items as dictated by circumstances. The committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item K was a contract extension for roadway restoration and debris removal. The recommendation by Mr. Kimball and seconded by Ms. Ben was that the board approve the first of two one-year contract extensions with J. Miller Construction Inc. for roadway restoration and debris removal. Based upon the mutual agreement of both parties with no increase in the prices in their original bid with funding primarily from regional services operating budget and other budget line items as indicated by circumstances. The committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item L was extension of a chemical contract bagged hydrated lime. The recommendation was made by Ms. Ben, seconded by Mr. Kimball, that the board approve the second of a two-year, two-one-year contract extension with Loist North America of Calaria, Alabama for the supply of bagged hydrated lime at the terms and rates offered by the supplier in the existing contract for an estimated annual cost of $534,055 with funding from the appropriate budget line item. The committee voted 9-0 in favor. Item M was a sanitation collection vehicle route wear system made by Recommendation was made by Ms. Benson and second by Mr. Kimball that the board redeem the rewear pilot project unsuccessful and reallocate the $300,000 in the sanitation department fiscal year 2020 CIP budget for the purchase of the rewear system CIP project CT0002 to the residential container replacement project CIP project RT902. The committee voted 9-0 in favor and I would like to move items G through M for approval. 
Is there a second? Mr. Second. Perkins. We moved and seconded. Any discussion? Dr. Walker? I want to thank uh, the sanitation department, and Mr. Mr. Rudd in particular, for pursuing the route wear uh, effort. Uh, uh, they've deemed it unsuc an unsuccess unsuccessful uh, program, uh, I would say, I would put it, but uh, it was a su successful effort to evaluate the project. And I appreciate the work they did on that. Hopefully sooner or later they'll find one that, that will actually help the drivers uh, make their way through the, through the, through the routes. Uh, that, that was good staff work and I do appreciate it. Ms. Campbell. I'd, I'd like to say I agree with that and uh, believe it or not, I, I, I was on vacation last week and I played golf with a friend from Birmingham who was a software engineer and all we talked about the entire th time was this root wear and how you could make it work. And I said, I don't think the um, root wear was the problem. I think it was the um, system in the truck itself. So we talked about that and, and uh, I said, if you go, go make one of these, you might make yourself some money. <laughs> anyway, it's unbelievable that you spend your vacation talking about Sad, sanitation really, trucks. Really. I think nerd is a word that comes to mind. No, you know, it, it, I think about the University of Florida that has the Gatorade, they get all of these revenues. I keep thinking, we've got all these smart people. Why don't we invent something that we sell to other sanitation departments uh -huh. and then we can reduce rates, we can fund all of this. Just a challenge to you. All right, if I see no more lights, so we're now voting on the items uh, H through M. And it passes four to zero. Uh, the next item is found on page 54. Um, it is the settlement of pend pending litigation, administration operations and maintenance building at the Central Water Reclamation Facility, construction and design defects. Uh, Mr. Sorrell, do you wanna briefly um, outline this? Yes, ma'am, I'll be brief. This is uh, potentially pending litigation, so everybody understands. Uh, this has been going on for quite a few years. When we built the uh, Central Water Reclamation Facility, we were concerned about uh, the roofing uh, structure itself. It was not done properly in our opinion, and uh, we filed suit. There was a suit filed against us, and then we filed suit, and it's been going on now for I don't know how many years, years and years and years. And uh, I was able to bring this to uh, culmination uh, last week, and uh, we actually were able to settle for exactly what we wanted the exact amount that we had to pay to make the repairs. So it's a, it's a great settlement and uh, uh, without going into any more detail, I want to recommend it to you. Uh, I don't think we could do any better. Thank you, Mr. Sorrell. Uh, is there a motion? Dr. Walker? I move approval of the uh, staff recommendation. It's been moved, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no lights, we are voting on approval of this settlement. Please vote. And it passes four to zero. Um, item 9A is emergency purchase notification water meter registers. It, it appears that we ordered a total of 5,813 registers at 129 each for a total of $750,000. As an emergency purchase, and I don't believe any board action is required on this. Do you, does anyone from the board wish to comment? Okay, then we will move to 9B an uh, emergency purchase no notification, East Romana Street water main utility relocation. Um, if you want to briefly describe that, Mr. Sorrell. Yes, ma'am. We were made aware of this particular situation. Uh, pretty uh, short time ago actually where a 12 inch water main owned by the ECUA was placed on private property actually in the wrong location but it was placed at the direction of a consulting engineering firm and a professional surveying firm. Uh, we did not know that it was in the wrong location until somebody decided to make the development and that's when it was discovered. Uh, we have uh, made arrangements here as you can see to hurry up and uh, um, 
move this water, lane, water main so that the person can develop the property. And as part of this, we've also filed a claim against the engineer and the surveying firm, and it will be remunerated for our costs. Okay, and again, no action is required on that. As, right. Uh, we come to. Can I ask a question? Sure. On that? I'm sorry. Is that is that um, normal when we find that? Um, I, I know that we inherited a lot of lines. Is it when we find those lines? Is it, do we normally move them, or if they're not in the way of development, do, what do we do in that situation? Mr. Sewell. Well, I think what we try to do first, if we found that one of our lines were on private property, we would try to either acquire the property or acquire an easement. And leave the main where it is in this particular case that was not possible we did look into that uh, we try to look at the least expensive approach in this particular time of, to move a 12 inch water main it's not easy so we had to come up with a whole new route and make arrangements and uh, just follow through and it has to be done quickly because they're getting ready to develop the property thank you and, and I might add I you know everyone on ECUA staff acted appropriately and swiftly and this this was clearly a mistake by one of our contractors and, and um, our staff recognized it and recognized the box that this uh, property owner was in. And um, it, it was, you know, government gets the reputation of moving very slowly and so forth. This was one where it was clear that there was an error that it was impacting them and, and our team really went to work on it, on it quickly. Yeah, I was, the reason I was asking, I, somebody sent me one last week and the survey shows it was in a different place than it was supposed to be. And when I first looked at the easement, it was 1970 something. And I said, oh, well, we probably inherited that one. Yes. So you might want to talk to talk to staff. So I sent right. them, that's what I did was send them to staff. Thank you. Okay, we go to 9C, which well, is and the- And I just wanted to say to oh, that, and, and, and we're not just having the ratepayers suck up the cost of it either. We're filing a claim with their insurance and they're you know, going to yeah. seek to recover those costs. Yes, thank you for making that point. And, and uh, Mr. Beasley, we have every reason to expect that we will have, the claim will be successful. Well, it's an insurance company. Um, <laughs> but we've timely made a claim. We've timely tendered a claim uh, to the surveyor who then timely tendered it to the insurance company whose adjuster immediately got involved. We notified them of the urgency so that we didn't get in a situation of spoilation of the evidence or damages. We documented the location. It's clearly documented by the green indicator post. The adjusters have gone out on the site. They've looked at the plans, the remodeling plans. They've asked all the right questions. It's being adjusted as expeditiously as you can expect by the surveyor's insurance company and haven't seen any reason to believe we're going to get um, into a fight with them. But it's an insurance company. Why did I not expect a promise of success from our <laughs> Okay, we move to 9C, which is award of bid, Windot Road, Euclid Street, Kersey Road, water meter, water main replacement. Um, uh, Mr. Sorrell, if you want to briefly tell us about this. Yes, ma'am, this is part of our uh, water line upgrade program, and we had our regional services staff actually take a look at some of the areas uh, that we use for transmission. And these are the three areas that they thought needed repaired uh, as quickly as possible. I think they're primarily transite systems. And we, uh, we experienced more than the normal amount of breaks in this particular area, so we've gone out and competitively bid it. And we're recommending that uh, we go ahead and award it to the low bidder, which is Pensacola Concrete Construction for the work, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Campbell? I'd like to move staff recommendation. It's been moved. Is there a second? I second it. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? I did notice uh, there are a couple of these where there apparently wasn't enough space on the form to fill out the full name of their companies, and so they abbreviated like C-O-N-S-T for construction. Do we need to redo our forms, or could we, I mean, why do we have to create a, an exception for this? Mr. Sorrell? I think it's more of a legal issue than anything else, but basically it happens all the time. And I don't think we need to make a bigger form. We need to get these uh, these contractors really to condense the, the name of their firm and get it all in that space that's available because our, our fearless attorney here, he makes them write it all out or he won't approve it. So it, it all works out. And I think we're training some of these contractors. It's just that they like to abbreviate uh, to get it done. Okay. Dr. Walker? 
Oh, I won't. Okay. All right. Seeing no further lights, we're voting on uh, item C. And it passes 4-0. Um, item 9D, award of bid, cantonment, trunk force, main CIP project number S129. Um, again, we have a minor uh, spelling issue. Uh, do you want to tell us about this one, Mr. Sorrell? Yes, ma'am. This is a, a pretty important uh, upgrade project in the cantonment area. We've had uh, quite a few concerns with uh, uh, with lift station 143, which is better known as Well Line Road Lift Station. We've had uh, more than our share of uh, sanitary sewer overflows at that particular location. So we're planning on upgrading that. Uh, um, and as part of that, we're also trying to upgrade a lot of the force mains. The, we went out to competitive bid. We got five contractors for this work. Uh, we were very surprised to see utility services uh, being a low bidder. Pri uh, they're a premier contractor. We don't have any problems with them. It's just been they've been so busy. They haven't been bidding low lately, and they've been not be getting a lot of work. So we recommend the award go to um, utility services and the base bid only. The uh, additive alternate uh, we'll consider at a later date. Uh, that involves the railway, and right now we don't we are involved in litigation with the railway, so we can't uh, do any work in that particular area until we get the uh, the legal matters resolved, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion? Dr. Walker? I move approval of the staff recommendation. Ms. Campbell? No, second. Is, uh, is this an I&I &I project? I assume it is. Uh, it can be considered that, yes, ma'am. It uh, clearly a uh, sanitary sewer overflow to lift station is I&I, &I, okay. and it is one of the projects, yes, ma'am. It, it would probably be worthwhile on on our agendas to highlight I and I projects, so we kind of keep a, in our minds a running tally of uh, of those projects that conform to, you know, our inflow and infiltration. Dr. Walker, Madam Chairman, it uh, seems like the only time we hear the name of a of a uh, uh, engineering firm, that a consulting engineer, is when they did it wrong, like the last one. Uh, uh -huh. Perhaps staff could begin to include the name of the consulting engineer in, in some of these uh, 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 agenda items. And in, in this particular one, I, could I ask who, who was the consulting engineer? Apparently they did a good job, and I'd just like to know. I think this one was Bastrell Donovan Incorporated, uh, but I'm not sure. We normally don't put their names in there because it's like free advertisement. And other other firms complain and so on, so we just uh -huh. leave that blank, <laughs> unless there is a real problem you need to know about, uh, because the, you know, we're not into the advertising end of it, and we just, if anybody really wants to know, they can find out, but uh, that's why we do it. Okay, I see no more lights. Let's vote on item D. and it passes four to zero. Item 9E is sole source procurements, Detroit Boulevard number 50, replacement CIP project RS-121Y. Mr. Sorrell. Well, this is another one that's uh, real, real important. Uh, back uh, an older gentleman that retired some time ago by the name of Bill Johnson. You might remember him. <laughs> I saw him the other day and his hair's down to here and I told him to get a haircut, but anyway. Uh, he retired from here as the director of engineering, but he brought a proposal some time ago to the board where he was going to try to get everybody to share in the costs. Uh, this area it wasn't acceptable to home builders, and the board voted it down. So we've been trying to work with the individual developers out here to put this together. This area is developing like crazy. Uh, it's the Detroit Boulevard area. Now, who would have ever thought five years ago it was going to develop like this? None of us knew that. Uh, so Detroit Boulevard lift station is a big one. And it's one that's right in the middle of all the development there. So what we're trying to do is upgrade that. We are doing two parts to that. This one is buying of the pumps and the panels and things that we need. The reason why we're doing it this way, if we have the contractor buy it as part of the project, they mark everything up 20%. That's just what they do. All contractors do it. So it saves us that 20%. Plus, if we buy it directly, there are other savings that we can acquire. So essentially, it's cheaper this way, and we get the exact components that we need. For example, the KSB pumps. Uh, Mr. Piscopo loves KSB pumps. There's others that he would not have. So 
it, it works out really well. Plus, we've got Cummins uh, emergency generator here. So we're getting everything we need and getting it on time so we'll have it. And we're getting ready to bid the project right now for construction and actually moving the lift station to another area and upgrading the lift station. So it'll be part of the system so that we'll be able to start serving some of the major development that's taking place in that area. But our main focus here is because of a lot of the problems we're having with sanitary sewer overflows in this area. So we're trying to offset that while providing additional capacity. This is a big project for us, and it's one that we need to do fairly quickly. Thank you. Is there a motion? Dr. Walker? Um, yes, I, I move approval of the project. Ms. Campbell? Ms. Second. And did you want to speak, Dr. Walker? Yes. Uh, it might help in, enlighten a bit on the importance of this project to mention that this it's called the Detroit Boulevard lift station, but its, it's uh, lift station area, I believe, is all the way up to east to West Nine Mile Road. And the, the development is not so much on Detroit Boulevard as it is up on the West Nine Mile Road area. Uh, and, and up there, everything is, is developing. Thank you. Very much so. Ms. Campbell. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we've had projects have to stop because they can't get, you know, Connections. I mean, you know, um, yeah, it's explosive. Yeah, it's exploding yeah. up there. So I'm happy to see this. Uh, Mr. Perkins. Miss Johnson is always so clean cut and everything. You say he grew his hair long. He looked pretty shaggy. Well, he, <laughs> man, he retired, grew his hair long. He's probably going to get him one of the medical marijuana cards. You know. <laughs> <laughs> If there's no further discussion, <laughs> I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> He's retired. He doesn't need it now. <laughs> we, are, we are voting on 9E. Please vote. <laughs> and it passes 4-0. When I leave this board, I'm going to write a book called Dale-isms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Item 9F is interlocal agreement for recyclables processing. This was an interesting uh, occurrence. Mr. Sorrell, do you want to walk us through what happened here? Yes, ma'am. As you know, we have, uh, I believe now we have 12 other agencies that bring us recyclables to our materials recycling facility. Uh, we started to bring this to the board uh, a month ago, and um, uh, along with uh, a handful of others. And Okaloosa County at that time decided they didn't want to pursue it. Uh, I guess subsequent to that, they received a lot of complaints from their citizenry, and they changed their mind, and they came back to us and wanted us to hurry up and get this back on the agenda. So I'm bringing it to you for approval. Uh, we have the ability to be able to process, process these materials at the materials recycling facility. You know, from time to time, we have concerns with uh, the quality of the recyclables with them and others. So we'll monitor that, but I'm recommending this to you. This will help out Okaloosa County. And uh, actually, I'd have had it on here last month if they hadn't pulled it. So right. thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Perkins. Moves the recommendation. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mr. Perkins. You know, we all know that China stopped taking the recyclables. The market crashed. <clears throat> but the way we structured our agreement was we had a scale. And, and so I understand that scale is still in place, isn't it? And so we did notice just very recently, hopefully the beginning of the recyclables market starting to recover and, and come back up. If that's the case, will the cost to these, con these contracts, these Okaloosa County and others like it, uh, will those costs go down if the recyclable markets go up? Mr. Sorrell? Yes, sir, it's based on a sliding scale. And if the, uh, the average material value goes to a certain level, um, it'll, they won't have to pay anything. If it goes above that, they actually get money back. So it, it all depends upon the sliding scale. Right now, the, the uh, AMV average ma uh, material value is very low. It's not the lowest it has been. It's, uh, I was going to tell you later, but it's about $49.99 a ton. It's been down to about $46 a ton, so it went up just a little bit. That's not a lot, but it helps. And I'm hoping to see that uh, continue to go up. Uh, and we're processing everything we make at the MRF. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Beasley and I sat in a hearing not too long ago and said they couldn't sell it and couldn't do so and so, and we're selling every bit of it just about. I mean, there's very little we're not selling. Now, we're not making a lot of money, but as long as it's paying for itself, I think we're doing just fine. So, yes, it, it is on a sliding scale, and yes, uh, they either pay us or we pay them depending upon the average material value. Uh, Ms. Campbell? I did notice when, uh, when they decided not to 
renew their agreement. It was all over media and social media. I certainly hope that it's all over media and social media that they change their mind and, and their citizens talk them into uh, taking another look. Mm -hmm. and, and it was 8.25%. It went up month over month, I believe, right, Randy? Thank you, Mr. Nimble. Uh, Dr. Walker? I think what apparently what happened in Okaloosa County was that uh, the citizens rose up and said, no, we want to recycle. And the commissioners who had just been making a cost-benefit analysis as the basis of their decision uh, had to back off and, and come back to us again. When I interviewed, as we all did, the, the four candidates for executive director, I ask each one of them, what should be the future of our recycling facility? And one of the four said, well, let's do, you should do a cost, cost benefit analysis and if it's costing you too much money, you just get rid of it, just, just you know, shut it down. The other three said, which is what I ex believed, that we can't shut it down no matter what the finances of it are, within some reason, I'm sure. But basically, the pub, I think the public expects it of us, and we will be operating this recycling facility. ECUA will be 50 years from now. Uh, at the same time, there, I mentioned that there is objection to it, criticism of it. Uh, when, uh, when it was noted in NorthEscambia.com that I was running for re-election next year, uh, one of the responses was that, that Walker and those others, but mainly Walker, I don't know why, but was resp is responsible for that $14 million boondoggle of a recycling facility, which is a, a total loss of money and, uh, and a disaster for the people of Escambia County. Uh, I, uh, so so that, that opinion is still out there. And in this coming election year, I'm sure we'll hear it, ex hear it expressed uh, in, in the elections that are, that are ongoing next year. Well, in my experience is the people of this community and across the country overwhelmingly support recycling. Um, I mean, the chairman of the Okaloosa County Commission called me the day after our meeting and he was getting so much uh, feedback from, from the citizens because they had stopped it that you're right, they were making what they thought was a prudent business decision, but it's kind of emotional to people. We care about doing the right thing for our environment. It's, it's kind of interesting. And we saw that when the city of Pensacola was dumping the recyclables into the landfill. So, I, I, you know, our, our task is to keep up with the citizens who, who believe in this, and, and hopefully the economy will, will do so as well. Uh, Mr. Perkins. Yeah, and I'm certainly complimentary of the Okaloosa County Commissioners because sure. they, you know, they're, you know, looking at numbers and make them <coughs> what they thought to be the you know the the best decision for their constituents and their <coughs> their finances and their taxes and uh and, and the thing that most impressed me about them is when they heard otherwise and this is the job of an elected representative is to you know 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 what the people want and to and to get that for them right. and so i think that was good that they were rapidly responsive and uh, i think that shows good leadership on their part so i'm glad to have them as a part of the team again and, I, and one thing, you know, when I leave this board, there are a few things that I'm going to be really proud of. You know, one of them, I think for me, the number one thing is fluoridation of the water supply and, and protecting, you know, the children's teeth. That's going to be number one. The number two thing is going to be the relocation of the Main Street sewage treatment plant. And, and the number three thing is going to be that we took the initiative against certain market forces that when nobody else would and implemented a regional recycling facility. And if it were not for ECUA and for us on this board, there would, no, there would not be any recycling in, in all of Northwest Florida. And so we went on a limb and did that and it was the right thing to do. And I think we're seeing that, you know, as, as the citizens have bought in to recycling. And, and initially, that wasn't the case. Not everybody was really bought in. So right. I'm glad we, we've done that. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Perkins. Uh, Ms. Campbell. Thank you, and, and I, I just want to reiterate everything that Dale just said. I, I'm very proud of this Northwest Florida. 72% of the people in Escambia County want to recycle, and we gave them an option mm -hmm. to use to recycle, so yes. I'm very proud yes. of that as well. And, and, and I want to reiterate, Mr. Perkins, welcome back to Okaloosa County. 
I, I think that was a true testament to their leader, leadership, what they did. So, um, Okay, we're voting on the interlocal agreement, 9F. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have a pink slip, so That's, if you'll fill I, I have it here. It was late in the process. Okay, Jason sure. Autry, Public Works Director for Okaloosa County. So all those kind words I will certainly take back. Um, you hit the nail on the head. We had an assumption of what we thought was going to go from a financial, from a business decision. And the word I will take away from our citizenry is passionate regarding recycling. Uh, we had a very strong, passionate uh, uh, contingency of citizens that came out to a workshop that we had and we've brought to you. I've got two originals with me here today. We certainly look forward to working again with Mr. Rudd and the staff over there uh, with the recycling and we want to be a long-term partner. So in 50 years, we hope we're with you. One of the analysis that we went through was a, a looking at the cost for recycling that's available to us. Um, and the deal that is offered with ECUA is um, absolutely favorable and something that we want to be a part of for a long, long time. You have a tremendous um, uh, service available, and uh, we look forward to being part of it. And yes, we have the sliding scale, and we're, we're committed to it now. So thank you very much for letting us come back, and uh, we hope this is a long and fruitful relationship. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no more lights, we are voting on the uh, interlocal agreement, number 9F. And it passes 4-0. And thank you for making the trip over. It's okay. And I think that concludes the operational items. We already took 9G, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so we come now. Sorry to 9H, Executive Director Search. Um, we had a brief discussion of this at the Citizens Advisory Committee meeting last week and referred it to the board, which was appropriate. Um, we have a number of options before us, and I'd, I'd just like to open it to the board for, for discussion as to, to where we go next. Dr. Walker. I'll be happy to go first. Uh, uh, I would, and to get right to the point, uh, my preferences are in follow are the following in, in order. Uh, first, I would, I think the best option would be for Mr. Sorrell to stay on for uh, a period of time while we let the, let the uh, uh, market for such this position sort of settle down and regroup and uh, some other names perhaps come to the fore and then advertise again, do another search and, and proceed with Mr. Sorrell remaining during this, through this period, which I would speculate is something like say six months. I think my, uh, my second option uh, is to either uh, appoint uh, one of the uh, assistant executive directors uh, as, as the interim director, uh, or uh, to appoint Mr. Bill, jo ask Mr. Bill Johnson to come back and serve in this position. After a haircut. A haircut or not, <laughs> I, I don't know. My hair is pretty long too. <laughs> but uh, 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 I, I think he would be uh, willing to consider this, and so I think you know, I'd like to suggest him as, as another option. If we don't, if we decided that we didn't want to Stir, up, stir the pot by removing one of the current assistant executive directors from his current position to something at, to the higher position. That, that might unsettle things in some way, and if we, if we thought that, then we might prefer to go with Mr. Johnson. My first choice then is Mr. Sorrell. My second choice is either one of the three acting uh, assistants or Bill Johnson, and my f last choice would be to go with uh, no, the, the re remaining candidates from the original list. Okay. But your first option is to go out with another search with this interim. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, there were some lights and they've disappeared. Ms. Campbell. Well, <laughs> you're just discussing or making? Yeah, I, let's, let's okay. just sort of discuss it if that's okay. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. fine with me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You were just giving your. Uh, that's. And that's fine. That's what I was going to do as well. I, I, I like all your options, but I would like to take, 
I would like my my first option would be to use one of our um, EDs here, um, deputy EDs, um, probably Don Palmer, to sit in to that spot until we can go out and do a research and allow the two gentlemen to to put their name in again, as well as anyone else that wants to put their name in again, um, and let Mr. Sorrell retire. I mean, he wants to retire. And as much as I love Bill Johnson, I'm sure that he's very happy with his hair in retirement. So, <laughs> but I do love Bill Johnson. But anyway, and then uh, my second would be to um, to go with one of the um, gentlemen. But I would like to go ahead and let Mr. Sorrell retire. I mean, he's been here. He's already delayed his leaving us one time. So that'd be my. When you say go with one, you, are you talking about going down the list to the applicants that we've To the applicants that we but have. But your first option was My first option is to, to um, go to the field appoint a deputy executive director, and we can vote on which one. Uh, we have three of them, and all three are capable, and I've talked with all three of them personally. I'm sure you all have too. Um, and then, um, you know, go down the list and to the next guys would be my second. And then my third would be to keep to ask Mr. Sorrell to stick, stay around. Just so I'm clear, does are you appointing a deputy and then going out to the field for a new search or exactly? Okay. And if and if that deputy would like to apply for that, I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Um, okay. I th I think I'm hearing both of you say that we want to initiate a new search. Uh, and I'm not hearing anyone say, let's just go down to the second choice or the third choice. Is, is, mm -hmm. I, I see nods of assent. Uh, why don't we start with a motion that we go out to the field with another search and ask Colin Benziger to prepare that search. With, and then we can talk about the logistics afterwards if someone is interested in making that motion. I'll make that motion. Uh, is there a second? A second. Okay. I'd, I'd, yeah, go ahead. I'd like, I, I would like to see us, you know, take a, a couple things. More than anything, I want the process to be fair, you know. And so that's why I feel like we should go out to search rather than just hiring one of our, our own people because people would say, oh, they didn't have to go through the same rigorous process that everybody else went through. So I, right. I think that if there's anybody inside the organization, that wants to apply, they should go through call ambassador in the same process that every screening and everything and, and, uh, and go that route. And, um, and then I think we should also um, look at the, you know, invite the previous two back. I mean, they may not want to come back if, if they weren't chosen. I mean, you know, or they may, but I think they're, they're both worth a second look. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to make sure we notify them that we're going to do a search and in include them in the search. And, um, and then, you know, I, I don't know, on the compensation package, I don't know, I, I think we advertised a higher enough salary to, to draw people, so I don't think it was the compensation uh, that did it. And, and I'd like to see us have some performance criteria, and this is probably for a later discussion, but I, I, I've always thought that, you know, we've never really had I mean, we've done occasional evaluations and stuff, but, but every organization or every entity, when they start something, they usually do a benchmark. And I'd like to see us have a customer satisfaction benchmark whenever the new person comes in and have their, their raises or their performance based on that customer satisfaction level raise. And to a certain point, I mean, you're never going to get over 70% or so happiness with a utility company that you're paying bills to every month, but, but to a certain percent. And have that performance based on, um, you know, that that maybe an annual or sim or you know twice every four years benchmark on on customer satisfaction, and then also on rate increases. I, you know, I don't think we've ever tied the executive director's performance to rate increases, and and it might be worth, and there are a lot of variables on it, so so I don't know, but but if have the performance measure on the rate increase be an add or below the CPI. 
And those are, you know, that's a different discussion further on down the low line, but I, I think we might start thinking. I know, I know Walker's going to be against that. I see you smiling. <laughs> but, I know, but I know it might be, I, I think we should have some real, perform and those might not be the only performance measures, but I think we ought to have some real concrete performance measures for whoever the executive director is, not only for us, but for them, so they know what our expectations are. Ms. Campbell? Boy, you're reading my mind. Um, okay, so first off, on the two gentlemen, I do not want to uh, in any way tell them that we are not interested in them. My main reason for going back to Cullen and going back to the field and allowing uh, someone to sit in here was because we have four members on this board and we need a fifth making this decision. So I think any of these gentlemen that are deputy executive directors can take this uh, this organization for the time that it would take for Colin to get us another group. And if that includes one of our uh, deputy executive directors, then so be it. And I do agree with Dale that they should go through the rigorous process just like everyone else. I was surprised that no one did. Um, second off, I love the fact that you talk about specific performance. Uh, that was one of the first things I said when I came on this board. I did not appreciate our performance guidelines. Kim and I spoke about this. We talked to specifically about uh, one that's called specific performance, not only for the ED but for everyone. So I'm glad that you said that. And I do like to see uh, performance tied to um, goal, not only goals, it, it would help in your decisions, you know, how you like to have the goal setting. You give yourself goals, then you agree on goals, and then if you don't make the goals, then you don't make the bell. So that I, I would love to see something like that. And, and, the, and the truth is, is that a fifth member may be necessary for us to, I mean, it looked like on this last situation that we're going to end up in a Mexican standoff, and we had mm -hmm. one of them before where we we didn't, I don't remember what it was, but we had a 2-2 before yeah, where we yeah. didn't reach a decision. Yeah. And I don't want us to be in that situation on an on a executive director, right. you know, right. choice. So, I, if I may, and I see your lights on, Ms. Campbell, I, the way I see what we're doing pr from a process point of view is w we will vote first whether to do another search. And then our second will be to decide what to do in the interim. I think that's a different discussion, so let's let's do it that way. Now, Ms. Campbell? I did just want to answer the sure. third thing. I, I like the way you think, and everybody knows I don't want to raise over CPI. I talk about it all the time, but I would not want to tie that to an executive director's salary, and for obvious reasons. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's vote then. The motion is to conduct another research for uh, another search national search for an executive director um, and there were no other restrictions on that right okay please vote and it passes four zero so we will yeah, go yeah, back to I'm the sure. now my understanding is that and Colin Basinger has been great, but my understanding is that they're proceeding with this all the way through till we find somebody without a whole bunch of additional fees and right. stuff, correct? They're committed to, to finding us a director. That was my understanding the contract, from right? the beginning. Okay. Even if we hired somebody and didn't like them after a short period. So right. I think they're... So they're, they're a good firm. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Okay, now the, the next issue is how we deal with the interim. We have three different options. One is to ask Mr. Sorrell to stay during this, which would probably be at least six months. Uh, a second option would be to look at the three deputies and ask one of them to be an interim. And the other one was to call Bill Johnson. Is that even viable? Has anyone even talked to him? Pardon? Has anyone talked to Bill Johnson? Do we have any reason to think that that's an option? Dr. Walker? I have reason to think that uh, he would be willing to do it if asked, not because he desires it, but uh, as a contribution to the ECUA, to his friends here. I see no lights, folks. Vicki. I, I, I would, do you want a motion? Uh, sure. Okay, I, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, appoint Don Palmer as the interim administrator um, until we process with Colin Basinger again. Is there a second? 
Mr. Beasley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to give a few thoughts on my interpretation of the code because I thought this issue may come up and it's, it's not clear, but I at least wanted to advise the board. First of all, the, and I've tried to reconcile the language of the code with our current organizational chart and I'm unable to do so. So by code, the executive director is given powers and in the absence of the executive director, director the deputy exec, executive director for operations. And I'm not sure if we currently have that title but that position would be automatically acting as the executive director by code. Um, now, also following, and it gets a little bit more tangled than that, um, following down you have when there's a vacancy of the executive director, the ECUA may appoint an acting executive director in the case of vacancy. So you have the authority to appoint if you don't allow the code to take over, and if Mr. Sorrell was absent starting on November 15, then by code, whoever is designated by title, the deputy executive director um, for operations would take over automatically. But then in section 2.14 of the code, it says the assistant executive director, which is a different phraseology, not the same title, and I'm not sure if there's such a person, has the authority to e execute contracts and so forth and so on and carry out the powers of the executive in the absence or vacancy of the executive uh, director. So we have a little bit of linguistic dance here about who the assistant executive director is versus who the deputy executive director for operations on who would have the authority given the vacancy. Um, and that may be important if you consider who is um, going to, in this next round of discussions. Now the reason I mention that is, is this twist the department heads. My understanding is each of the three being considered are all department heads. So the department heads by this code are exclusively appointed and controlled by the executive director, which means that if you take someone from that position and put them in the executive director position and then we hire a new executive director, there's no way to demand of the executive director that they go back to the department head position. So we have to be aware of that and make sure that we're because you are absolutely prohibited from influencing the executive director on appointing the department, department heads. So you may have a scenario where if you don't allow the code to operate the way it's operating, and you, and you certainly have the right, you have the right and authority to appoint an interim of any type, but you may very well be in a situation where that person being appointed interim, and there may be a way we can work it depending on what you end up. I just wanted you to know what's going on here, that that person then is no longer in that department head position, and then there's no way to put them back. Interesting. Um, and I just want to lay that out there. Um, again, we're a little bit tangled in li linguistics here because our, our organizational chart doesn't match what the code says at this point because I think we actually have three deputy executive directors. And I'm not sure which one is titled for operations, although I think it may be Mr. Rudd. Yeah, I think uh, it's Mr. Rudd. Um, is that, I can make an amendment. But I've looked at Mr. I've tried to look at the titles on the website and otherwise, and I don't find that exact title. Sounds um, like something we ought to go back to the legislature to clear up, clear up, too. I mean, just the verbiage of that. At some point, it's not critical. But how did we do it before when Mr. Haig, uh, Mr. Haig was the interim during? He was, he was the assistant deputy director at the time. He was, okay. Yeah. So by then, by code, he would have fallen yeah, right he into would the have position fallen either way. Uh -huh. So it can't, so it couldn't be any of the three. So when I was talking to Mr. Well, it could be, but it's real tenuous for them because yeah. they're not promised their job back right. if they take it. So you may not find any of them that want to do it in that situation. And if, and if the board decides that that's their preference and maybe give us a little time to figure this out in a way that would ensure, I, certainly I think, I, th I think no one would take the position and, and lose their job. Um, right. Um, and so we need to figure out if there's a way to alter or amend what we're doing here with this. They're, none of them are under contract. so. There's no contract issue, it's just a matter of complying with the code. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's clear to me is that once you have another executive director, you could not instruct them to reappoint that department head. Okay. Ms. Campbell, you had something? Um, Thank you. About okay. Yeah. Dr. Walton? Sorry. I think Dale was going to say. He, he reneged and then well, came back. The truth, the, truth, uh, the truth is, yeah, we can't instruct them to reappoint that department head, but we do have some influence over the executive director and whether we keep them or not. Okay. And, and the other thing is, is that the truth also is, is that 
you know, if we can't direct them to keep that department head, we can't direct them to keep any of the department heads. I mean, they could come in and get rid of all of them, you know, so that's the truth about, you yeah. know, the, you know, the new executive director. Sure. So that's just part of the, that's just part of the this, this situation now. So do we know if, if anybody is currently the director, the deputy executive director of operations? I believe that would be Randy, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Sorrell? That would probably Jerry Piscopo because okay. he runs all the operations basically. Randy runs shared services, which right. is solid waste, but he has some of the administrative operations under him. So Jerry is one that really runs all the operations. And do we currently have an executive assistant executive director? No. <laughs> so what if we hired somebody outside the organization like Mr. Um, Walker was talking about with Bill Johnson? Mm -hmm. Some, certainly that falls under your authority to appoint an interim in the case of a vacancy. Uh, so the statute provides that an automatic uh, step up by the deputy executive director of operations, but, if, but then you can override that by appointing your own interim, and that doesn't create any of the, the reappointment issues that we just discussed. Okay, Dr. Walker. Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I think the, the term Deputy Director of Operations was, uh, as it appears in the code, probably is a different, was a different concept from the current title that Jerry Piscopo holds. I really don't think that uh, there's a, uh, that th they're one in the same thing. Uh, and basically, I think we don't have a position such as was uh, in the code, named in the code back, back when. Uh, so I think we're rather free to ignore that language, basically. Uh, I, uh, I still, you know, I, I, my, my preference is to find the option that least causes the least disturbance in the force uh, uh, within ECUA, and uh, I, I still think that the, the least disturbing way would be to keep Mr. Sorrell, which would disturb only Mrs. Sorrell, uh, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, I think everyone at ECUA would be happy with it. Uh, or secondly, to uh, consider Mr. Johnson, who could come in without disturbing any of the existing arrangements. Thank you. Ms. Campbell. I, I, I agree with Dr. Walker on that any of the three would be considered executive director, so I, don't, I think we'd be fine with any of the three that we currently have as executive directors. And I agree with you that we probably need legislature to correct our, or correct our organizational chart, one or the other, mm -hmm. as soon as we get a new executive director. But um, other than that, um, I think we can, we can do an interim. So, uh, go ahead, Mr. Perkins. So, okay, I have a question about the legal term of vacancy. So, you know, we're trying, Mr. Sorrell has served us very well for 17 years, and we're trying to accommodate him, you know, to, to get him, you know, through to retirement and everything. And so we're going to have him kind of in limbo, taking his earned leave over, over the many years that he's been here. And so while he's taking that earned leave, does that meet the legal definition of vacancy? Mr. Beasley. Thank you. 2-57 under the same section that I just read from about the Deputy Executive Director of Operations Shall Act has a subsection E on vacancy, and it says, the office of the Executive Director shall be declared vacant in the event of the incumbent's termination, resignation, death, moving of residents from the county, or if he or she, by unexplained absence, illness, or other disabilities, unable to continue in the office or perform the duties of the office. A vacancy in the office let me stop there. That really gives you no guidance. The next sentence might give a little more guidance. A vacancy in the office shall be filled within six months from the time the vacancy occurs in the manner as the original appointment, period. The ECUA may appoint an acting executive director in the case of vacancy until such time as successor has been appointed and qualified. I read the second sentence to indicate that um, the first sentence clearly has the term resignation, which occurred. Then I read the second sentence to, um, to read as if it's the date that he actually leaves the chair um, because it says vacant in the office, so he's no longer presently there. So what we have now, I think, is a resignation, 
with a date of departure of November 15th currently announced. And I think after November 15th, he would qualify as being vacant. Dr. Walker. Uh, if we chose to ask Mr. Sorrell to stay on and he agreed to do so, there would be no vacancy. He would simply continue his employment uh, as it currently works. That's my understanding. So we wouldn't have to worry about matters of vacancy. Ms. Campbell. I'm, change, I'm amending my motion to read as acting administrator. Uh, would you recite the motion? I lost the it. The motion anyway. was to appoint Don Palmer as acting administrator from November 15th until we find a replacement. And Mr. Beasley has. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to note that the, the, sta the statute says acting executive director. interesting the first part of this was easy we, we know we want to go back into the field this the second is what to do in the interim I, I am in favor of having a different person I think mr. Sorrell is ready when when you're ready to leave and and he has guided us through this I think it, I and it also tells the people in the field in the search that we're serious we we have a sense of urgency now the question is, who should take the helm? I, I'm kind of intrigued by the Bill Johnson idea, and I'm intrigued by that if you would do it, because we have three deputies who already have a full plate. You know, they do a lot, and then to say, well, we want you to keep doing this, plus you want we want you to be over the entire operation, that is fairly huge. Um, you know, so I, I guess my inclination would be, number one, to reach out to Bill Johnson to see if this is just a pipe dream that we have or if he would be interested. But then I would, I think it would probably be worthwhile to interview the three deputies that we have and Bill Johnson if he's interested and then make a decision. You know, we know these deputies in the capacity in which they operate, and we have a lot of faith in them. But I, before selecting one, I think it would be worth just having an interview with, with all three of them, plus Bill if he's interested, and making a decision. It kicks it down the road for another month, but I'm not sure that's a bad idea. So I guess that that is in opposition to your, your motion, and I'd like to hear other thoughts. Mr. Perkins. Well, I, you know, I like I like the thought of of um, if we're going to have an interim executive director, and and allow Mr. Sorrell to proceed with his plans in life, then um, then an outside one rather than one of the three that's competing for the job would be better because you don't want to have controversy among those three on the team and and you know think that one has a special advantage or or is more favored um, than the others. So if Mr. Johnson would do it as an interim, I think that that would be the way to go. Also, you know, we have Mr. Sorrell designated to, to stand down on November 15th. I mean, it, you know, it might make sense to ask him that the next board meeting is early in, I mean, in, in November 15th, the next board meeting in December is typically pretty early because of Christmas. I don't know what the exact date of the December board meeting is, but if there were, um, a desire, I mean, we could ask Mr. Sorrell to stay until that December board meeting and say, hey, that is the final, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200 date, and, and uh, ask him if he'd stay till then, try to bring Mr. Johnson on board in the interim, and, uh, and continue with the search. I, I don't know if he'd be willing to do that, but it would get him out of here before Christmas, you know, and he could spend Christmas with his, with his family and, and all that, and, and, uh, and go on from there. Um, but then again, he, you know, he may want November. He might want to be out here before Thanksgiving. Who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. He said he's willing to work with us and help us any way he can. But I, I think that if I had to choose among somebody interim and Mr. Johnson were willing to do it, um, I'd prefer that. But, it, but, but he may not be. That's why it might make sense to keep Mr. Sorrell until, 
December 15th or whatever that December date is, just in case Mr. Johnson doesn't, so that we can um, go from there. Thank you, Mr. Was there a second to your motion? No. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Walker, does that conclude what you, yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Walker? Madam Chairman, I'll, I'll be uh, a bit more explicit. Uh, within the past week, I've spoken with Mr. Johnson, and he said that he has no no desire, no eagerness particularly to, to, to uh, come back as an interim director, executive director, but that if it served the welfare of the agency of the organization, he would be willing to do so. Is that a motion? Uh, well, I'll, I'll make a motion, yes, that we, that we uh, uh, ask that we uh, uh, express a preference to, to appoint Mr. Bill Johnson as our acting executive director and that we uh, designate the uh, chairman of our board to communicate with Mr. Johnson regarding that with the assistance of our attorney uh, to, uh, uh, to see if, to ensure that he's willing and able to do so and if so to reach an agreement with him. Is there a second? What were you thinking about for a, for a start date if he were to be, become interim? Well, I don't know, but I think that would be part of the negotiation and also in, in, in talking with uh, Mr. Sorrell, perhaps November 16th or 15th. I guess we could leave that up in the air until it, we can find out with him, number one, whether he'll take it, which it sounds like he would, and then, and then you know, when he could be available. Um, I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Mr. Beasley. It, and maybe I misheard because I was reading, but I thought that Ms. Campbell made a motion. It and was then not it was, seconded. Okay, I thought it was seconded by Mr. Perkins. It was not. Okay, no. very well, thank you. <coughs> All right, your light's on. You're finished with what? To, sp to speak in support of my motion. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, any of the, our three deputy executive directors could do the job well, and it, each of them is a great person to have on our staff. And uh, and and to to have another preference in the about this is not to demean any of those three at all. I respect them greatly. They do wonderful jobs, and in fact, I I don't want it's because I don't really want to disturb them in their jobs. I mentioned a disturbance of the force, so well, uh, can have a meaning for ECUA. I don't. I want to let them go ahead, keep on going with doing the wonderful jobs they're doing, and the least disturbing way to accomplish that, I think, and other than keeping Mr. Sorrell would be to uh, go outside, and Mr. Bill Johnson is the perfect possibility there. Thank you. Ms. Campbell? I would just like to, um, well, number one, that failed for lack of a second. Uh, it was second. Mine. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. But I would just like to thank uh, the three executive directors to, for um, speaking to me um, this week. I talked to all of them. All three of them, you know, I think we've talked in the past, would be willing to step in. And I do agree, I would never want them to have to step back into another position. So for that reason only, I will support this. And I would also encourage all of them that if any of them want the position to apply for it, because we're certainly not ruling you out. I mean, it would be a, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be interested. See, I'd, I know these individuals based on the current roles and, and very little other than that. I mean, most of their inter interaction goes through the executive director, but I would definitely be interested in learning more about each of them and, uh, and who knows, you know, what might happen. Dr. Walker, I want to thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, you know, I think this would have been a very, very difficult position for us to be in because we have three strong deputy directors and we all sort of hate the idea of elevating one above the others because I think we appreciate them all equally in different capacities. Plus, we would also be sort of upsetting the whole realm of, of um, responsibility. So I think to, to bring in Bill Johnson is just a wonderful idea. He's well-respected in the community. His 
name came up to me in a meeting with some people today, and I, I think he is well liked by the staff, um, and and he would not be perceived as somebody with an inside track when we go to the field, which is also a concern. You of, often worry about how applicants view this, whether they think, well, I'm not going to apply because you know they've got an inside guy. So he he would clearly. I don't think he wants the job. So I, I think it's a great solution. I support your motion. Um, and thank you for creativity. Um, I see no more lights. Are you ready to vote to offer this to Bill Johnson? Okay, please vote. Is mine filled in? I don't know if mine is either. Oh, no, these things are terrible to see. Yeah. We need a vote. Pardon me? Oh, you need a vote from you. From me? I've been punching it. There you go. Thank you. Sorry. These little things. I know, they're, they're funny. Things. And it passes 4 0. Um, this is an incredible board to serve on because leadership comes from every single chair on this board. And, um, What a pleasure it is to work with the rest of you. Anyway, thank you. Ms. Campbell, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Dale for talking about those accomplishments um, earlier. Uh, two of those, one was the reason I joined this board. It was, uh, there was fluoride, uh, you know, against fluoride already on the board, and one running against Ms. Benson, and, and that was the main reason, one of the main reasons that I ran, and then, uh, the material recycle facility was really, really dear to my heart. I, I hate that I didn't, um, wasn't part of moving that plant, but I thought it was one of the greatest things that's ever been done in this city. Here, here. Thank you. That concludes the operational items. We come now to our budget report. Ms. Sheldon. Mr. Beasley, thank you for your research on, on that. That was very helpful too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have a budget report to present to you at this time. Uh, I just got the accrual numbers for the revenue for fiscal 19, and so I will be working on putting together our budget true up for next month's meeting, and I will have numbers for you at that time, which will include all of the accrued revenue and all of the accrued expenses. So it would be a much better report next month than it would be this month, because it wouldn't be complete. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Walker? Yes. Uh, is there any terrible news that we might we should anticipate? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't expect it to be different from what I've been telling you. I mean, we, we know that the MRF budget is over budget. Um, we've talked about that in the past. Um, I, I need to look at the revenue for the sanitation and compare that to the expenses. We have had some large expenses in sanitation through the um, maintenance of the vehicles and um, gas and oil and some overtime. So I don't expect anything you know, out of what I've already told you, out of line of what I've already told you, um, but I would like to get those final numbers together so that I have good numbers to give you. They'll be unaudited at that point, but um, our auditors will be, that I'm getting ready for the auditors to come in, so I'll have those numbers, and then they come uh, the week after Thanksgiving to start the audit, okay? Thank you. The next is the executive director's report. Mr. Sorrell. Yes, ma'am. I only had two items to report. The one I already told you about, and it's the average material value at the MRF. It's it stayed very consistent. Uh, it's only gone up two dollars and something, which is I think Vicki mentioned it was eight point some percent, but it's at forty nine ninety nine, and we're processing everything, but we're not making a lot of money. But we're still processing. Second thing I wanted to let you know, I received a call today from. Uh, the Florida Department of Emergency Management. Uh, if you remember back in 2014, there was a large rainstorm. There was a uh, considerable amount of damage caused to the uh, 
uh, to the filters at the central water reclamation facility because of the inflow of so much material and, and debris and so on, it damaged all the filters. We developed a plan to do a bypass of the filter and chlorine contact chamber in order to avoid that if we ever get another major storm. Essentially what that would do is take the flows to the uh, uh, reject storage pond, then we process them back through the plant after the storm had passed. Well, we filed a claim with FEMA at the time uh, for about $1.5 million, 1.4, 8, or 9, something like that. But it's about $1.5 million. And we haven't heard anything. That's been, what, five years now? Uh, I got a call today, and it looks like we're going to be able to get that project approved. Uh, it's, already in, it's already designed and ready to go. Uh, we committed to have it done within one year, and uh, I think that paperwork is going to come forward, so we should be getting a $1.5 million grant in order to uh, implement the uh, bypass of the filters and chlorine contact chamber at the CWRF um, by automatic valving just in case a major storm arrives. And that's all I had, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Soro. Uh, attorney's report, Mr. Beasley. I have no report. Okay. Uh, we have nothing under unfinished business. Uh, under new business, Dr. Walker, the CAC appointment. Madam Chairman, um, my appointee for, to the CAC for the past 12 months is Mr. Kevin Hammer. I know you've seen him at, at most of the meetings in the last 12 months. And uh, uh, I, I just wish to tell you that uh, he, his 12-month appointment has ended now, and someone else will be uh, seated uh, at the next committee meeting or whenever we do it. Uh, but I just wanted to express my appreciation uh, to Mr. Hammer for the work that he did as a committee member. He, he didn't speak up frequently, but he spoke up well. He had good questions. He had good comments. And uh, I, I'm very, very appreciative of the role that he played during the last 12 months. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Walker. Um, do, you have a, do you have an appointee? Because they, typically the board has to approve them. And so if they're going to make the next CAC, or will it, will it get another time? As I understand, I'm thinking that the uh, uh, new, new board members, if any, well, then there are none, uh, and uh, new committee members will be appointed prior to the next meeting. But perhaps I'm wrong. Organization. Or at the yeah, time, my, my whatever. Yeah, November. We'll work right. it out. Okay, good. Uh, does anyone have anything to share under board communications? Ms. Campbell? I would like you to thank Mr. Hemmer because he did have some fantastic questions and brought up some really good points during the CAC, and I really appreciated his um, input. Thank you. Mr. Perkins? I have noticed in a couple of the reports that, you know, we're having a great deal of growth along the Beulah nine, West Nine Mile Corridor, and there are some situations where we're not able, people are not able to proceed with projects because we don't have a enough capacity and I and I know we we typically you know we'll try to to get there once the you know in slower development times you know when things weren't just like booming like they are out there we have basically waited and then you know when when a development is proposed we will go ahead and and look at oversizing and stuff and I, I'm just hoping that if there are opportunities where we're upgrading things or replacing things or the roads are tore up that if we if we need to start oversizing some of these lift stations or whatever pipes or whatever we're putting in that we recognize there's growth occurring out there and that if there are, are economical opportunities to do some oversizing we we start doing it rather than waiting till it happens and then we're like way behind on on meeting that need thank you thank you mr perkins dr walker uh, i'd like to add to that that uh, we might remember that the engineering department staff, specifically Mr. Johnson as the leader of it, uh, attempted to come up with a, a plan for that Detroit Boulevard lift station area a couple of years ago now, I guess. But uh, it, it got wrapped around the axle of some other things, and, uh, and I think we turned it down. Uh, so staff was ahead, trying to be ahead of this, this particular problem, but uh, we politics, lobbyists, you know, or whatever kept it from happening. It might be worth having a workshop on growth. You know, we, 
we, we never get it quite right, the balance of trying to repair existing infrastructure and planning for new and, uh, you know, the economy is good and we're seeing all of this growth and, and um, it, it might be worth having a CAC meeting workshop where we, we look at the needs and we have input on a, on a clear path of how we want to, to move forward, at, um, maybe after the holidays. Ms. Campbell? I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Walker. Dr. Walker. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, as I'm sure we all know, there's a great deal of interest in community growth and the form of that community development should take in our community in the Pensacola area now. Mm -hmm. uh, I get something in my email box almost every day from one of the active leaders of this or one of the groups uh, inviting me to attend meetings that, that I usually cannot attend. But uh, uh, there are people who are very much involved in this general topic right now and perhaps we could make some connections with them. Thank you. Ms. Campbell? Um, I did want on board communication to say that I've been talking with Mr. John Dana this week because um, I was trying to get on the board on the website and find some policies and you're unable to find our policies on the website. If you put in the word policy, nothing came up. If you put in the word water in the search engine, nothing would come up. Now, I'm told that that was corrected today and that there are a lot of articles, if you try to get to them, it says um, some kind of error message 404, which you couldn't get to. Um, I reached it about 20 times in what, when I was doing some search work this week. And so John is, I'm happy to say, working on that as well. And it should all be repaired this week. But I would like to see our policies up on that, up on the website. I see nothing else. We have another open forum. No pink slips. Has anyone 